All right, we're back at the NFL Report. And, James, I have been looking forward to this. We are bringing in former Falcons general manager Thomas Dimitrov. TD, how you doing, man? I can't wait to talk to you guys. It is, it is cold and hot down here in Atlanta for sure. There's a lot going on. Well, right. on that note, because we were, we were going to slow play into that, but on that note, let's get right to it. You talk about it hot being in Atlanta, TD, and that's because Bill Belichick, who you used to work for with the Patriots, is having his second interview with the Atlanta Falcons where you served as general manager. Just knowing that building, what do you think these tea leaves are telling us about what, what could possibly happen or what's likely to happen? Of course, I have not been in conversation with anything about anyone about this. You know, this this is me stepping back, knowing both gentlemen very well, right? You have Arthur Blank, one of the best owners in the league, as you know. He's going to do all he can to to make and help that organization be the best that it can possibly be at so many levels, as you know that. And then you have Bill Belichick, who I maintain, and as, as does your buddy Scott Pioli and all of us who have been around him, he is the very best in modern times. And and just like Mike Lombardi said, he is probably third only behind um, Vince Lombardi and Paul Brown. Like what he can do for an organization yeah. is, is in, in my mind unparalleled. And so wherever he ends up going and whatever he ends up doing, you and I both know he brings the organization that he does go to closer to a Super Bowl in the next three to four years than anyone out there in my mind. And that's not taking away from anyone out there that we know. This is an amazing, in my mind, group of coaches with Dan Quinn out there. You know how I feel about him with Mike Vrabel out sure. there you know, with Harbaugh. There's a lot of great opportunities. It's going to be really interesting. CD, I'm curious with, with Bill Belichick and you knowing him so well, and there's seven openings right now. Does he think, Fit in all seven, though? I feel like when you look at him and what he's accomplished and what he's done, is there a certain group of teams that probably fit him better than saying maybe just because he's at the top of your list, he would fit all seven of these? Look, my, my feeling on this is anyone who has the stature that, that Bill Belichick has, and of course there are very few, but any of those really experienced coaches that have a really you know strong stance on everything and they should right they've deserved it through, uh, they deserve it through an incredible amount of time in this league in an understanding of football the only thing i would say is those organizations that have that first time general manager or first or second year general manager mm. it becomes a little more complicated thomas I, I want you to kind of take us through the process not specifically speaking to anyone but using your experiences right when i worked for the atlanta journal constitution I covered the team when you were hired as general manager, and it's a two-parter, but just your experiences going through the interview process to get this job that so many people are doing right now, interviewing for jobs. And then the second part is when you were part of the coaching search in Atlanta, when you ended up hiring Dan Quinn. So where do you want me to lead on that then? Sorry, Steve. So, so let's, let's, start, let's, let's start with you going through the process, which so many of these GM candidates are, are going through right now, like, Okay, how do I interview for this position? What do I tell teams how I want to build this team? Because you came in not knowing who your head coach was going to be. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, when I first started way back in 2008, when we, when we brought on Mike Smith through that whole process, and then moving on to Dan Quinn, obviously, in 2015, uh, excuse me, very different search situations, right? I mean, Arthur Blank was really good to allow me as a general manager, a first time general manager to go through myriad uh, lists uh, as far as what we needed at that point. That, that is, that is so, there are so many layers to it, Steve, but it, to me it's contingent on, on where your organization is at that time, right? Our, our interview process for Mike Smith back in early 2008 was very different than it was with Dan Quinn in 2015 because of where we were roster wise, where we were with a quarterback, what we needed to do. Mike Smith, as you know, great head coach, three time coach of the year. And there were changes that need to be made, right? You look at that as a, as a GM and as an owner, of course, and you say, okay, here are all the great things about the former head coach that, that was here. And now, and here are the things that were, were challenges. We want to make sure that the next head coach that comes in doesn't bring to the table some of the same challenges or that person, the new head coach potentially to come in uh, 
no, we know that 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 coach is not going to be uh, running the same line of trying to deal with some of the stuff that maybe slow played the coach that came in or was there before. I guess what I'm saying is very very different in a lot of layers and a lot of a lot of conversations about leadership about about abilities of the coaches right we would go through myriad conversations again to use that word about how you know what what is the best way to approach that coach you're talking about ability to coach talking about ability in the in the meeting room you're talking about ability to to develop players um there again those are things that we really have to drill down on as as general managers and former general managers and for everybody listening, that, that's kind of what's happening in Washington, right, Thomas? It, they get Adam Peters, and now they're kind of going into their head coaching kind of search after they've established that. So, so to piggyback off of what you just said, I'm fascinated by we're so entrenched in where coaches come from. Their coaching tree, as we always say. What tree did they come from? Did that ever play a factor, or does it play a factor, when you're looking at a coach knowing where he came from and which tree he came from? Yeah, there's no question about that, James. I mean, you're looking about how they were raised. Their, their, honestly, their approaches to building a team, their approaches and their former, whoever they came up through, their former head coach, their mentors, so to speak, how they, quite honestly, and a lot of GMs do this, how was this, this guy that we're going to be interviewing now, how was he raised as far as personnel goes, right? Make no mistake about it, James. Every one of these GMs that have personnel background, want to make sure that they are pairing with a with a coach that a understands personnel understands the ability to evaluate understands again there are so many levels to evaluating that is a big big deal no one and i go back into my first time with with um you know someone like uh, mike smith i wanted to make sure that mike knew about evaluation believed in evaluation believed in the scouting system and understood that the scout scout and the coach's coach and then within that, that we are able to come together as GM and head coach and be able to discuss at so many levels the nuances of the system. That is, is vital. You're, most of these general managers out there, most, not all, of course, you guys know this, Howie Roseman and Mickey Loomis, two of the best out there. Those guys came from a different, you know, a, a different uh, road, just like Brandon Bean did, right? Brandon Bean too, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's some really good ones out there that don't have personnel background, Everyone in this spot wants to make sure they have a workable relationship with their head coach. No one wants to come in this where they're batting their head against the wall every day that they're trying to help build the team, James. So again, very, 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 very important to make sure you know how these guys are raised. And some, last, qu last point, some that were raised in certain paradigms that don't have a real respect for the personnel staff, that, that can be very treacherous. And, and it, it, it can be a it can be a short lived relationship, of course. Thomas, I'm so glad you said that because I remember the union with you and Mike Smith and you stress the importance of the separate but collaborative dynamics that you were just talking about. Lastly, we have about a minute here, Thomas. You got to find a quarterback. You were fortunate to come into a situation your first time. You had a number three overall pick and you got Matt Ryan. How vital is it, you know, when you look at some of these circumstances to know who is going to be the proper guy to fit into your locker room? And real quick with a caveat, remember, Thomas, everyone was telling you to draft defensive lineman Glenn Dorsey instead of Matt Ryan at that time. <laughs> there was a lot of that, as you know, in town. And we won't mention some of the names, but, yeah, oh, look, I mean, anyone, even, even a head coach, a GM that potentially could be coming into a team, one of the main things we're looking at, of course, we're looking at who the ownership is. Make no mistake about that as well, gentlemen. If you don't know the owner, at least have a grasp of what the owner is and, the, and their approach, that's a big deal. Now, when you're a first-timer, you, you're open. We always used to joke about this. You're open to say, like, I'll work anywhere. I could do anything with anyone. Just give me the opportunity. And as you get experience, you're a lot more particular about that. That's one thing. Of course, the quarterback is massively important. Not only that the quarterback might be there, but the, that the quarterback is within reach, that there's a potential – to get a free agent, or equally important, that you are in a draft spot that you know that you might get one of these top five this year. If you're 22 coming in or 18, and you're going to have to move up and sell the farm to get up there, that's a little bit different when you're talking about making sure that you get the right quarterback to build around. 
All right, so I got to squeeze this one in, Thomas, because this is what I'm fascinated about. Look at the Bears, right? They have what some people believe is their quarterback, but they also have the number one overall pick. How would you, kind of looking at that from an outsider's perspective, kind of look at that spot that Ryan Poles is in right now, and is that a very difficult spot? Would it be a fun spot from a GM perspective? What 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 is he dealing with right now? It's a lot of sleepless nights, I'm sure. I mean, there's a there's an element of excitement about it, right? To know that you are in such control and have the opportunity to continue to build. Yes, it's a it's a I think it's a great spot to be in. You know, remember that that pick was not on Ryan Poles, right? We know that. Uh, not not that it's whether it worked or not, but as again, general managers, normally you want to stay with the quarterback that you that you picked and you brought in. Of course, yep. Ryan Pace, who I have a great deal of respect, you know, he was the one who actually d- drafted him. So, you know, who knows where where he ends his quarter his former quarterback ends up. But great spot to be in if you're Ryan Poles, I believe. TD, absolutely great stuff. I mean, this, you know, we try to enlighten, and, and you just really, really open the bandwidth of some minds here with some of these topics. Brother, we appreciate you taking the time for us. Hopefully we can get you back on here again. Love to be back. Anytime, gents.